My name is Jim Weisel, Professor of Accountancy at Georgia Gwinnett College. This is the second in a series of videos demonstrating how to account for leases. In the first video, we talked about Nate Langstrom's leasing opportunity, and under those original terms of the contract, uh, it turned out to, that the lease was accounted for as an operating lease. In this one, in this video, we're going to uh, demonstrate a slight change in the uh, terms of the lease and demonstrate how to account for a capital lease. Okay, so uh, last time we looked at Nate Langstrom, uh, we had all the basic terms here of the uh, contract and concluded that this was going to be treated as an operating lease because we answered no to all four criteria. Uh, that being, did the title transfer? Was there a bargain purchase option? The lease term was less than 75% of the useful life and the present value of the lease payments was less than 90% of the fair market value of the asset. Uh, on that basis, we determined that it was an operating lease and we simply debit lease expense and credit cash every time we make a lease payment. So now what we're going to do is uh, we are going to change the terms of the lease a little bit and let's say that everything's the same, discount rate 6.5%, fair market value is $90,000, uh, the useful life of the asset is six years, and so on. What we are changing here is the lease term. So instead of renting this asset for two years and making four uh, payments, what we're going to do is lease this for five years and uh, make ten payments. Again, payments are occurring twice a year. So on that basis, we're now going to reevaluate the terms of the contract. Once again, we ask ourselves, does title transfer? We didn't change anything there, so the answer to that is still no. Uh, was there a bargain purchase option? Again, we look at the original terms of the lease contract. No mention of the ability to purchase the asset sometime during the lease, and so we answer no to that as well. Now here's where we get into the impact of some of the changes. The question again here is, is the lease term greater than or equal to 75% of the useful life of the asset? And we can see here that in fact the lease term is five years out of a six year useful life, which is 83% of the useful life. That's clearly more than 75%. And so we answer yes to this question. Answering yes to this question alone makes this a capital lease rather than an operating lease. Remember, we only have to answer yes to any one of the four questions. It doesn't matter which one, but answering yes to any one of the four will make this a capital lease. So we already know this is a capital lease. And uh, now uh, we need to, however, still determine the present value of the lease payments because once we know we have a capital lease then it is necessary for us to determine the valuation of that lease and under US GAAP uh, capital leases are typically valued at the lesser of or the smaller of either the fair market value of the asset ninety thousand dollars in this case or the present value of the lease payments which is what we need to compute so we are going to take all of our uh, information with regard to uh, the lease and I'm going to show you how to calculate all this again. Uh, and so I'm going to clear out my present value, clear out my time value of money information, uh, make sure that my interest payments are again still set up for two payments per year. And then I uh, insert the information that I know about. So for example, I'm making 10 total payments. They are $10,000 each, inserted as a negative uh, in the payment uh, menu path. So it's a negative $10,000. Interest rate is 6.5%. And I compute present value. And we can see that the present value is $84,224. $84,224. Out of a $90,000 fair market value is 94%. So, in fact, we can see that we're going to answer yes to two of these questions. We're actually going to answer yes to uh, the lease term, and we're also going to answer yes uh, to the present value. 
again, uh, it doesn't really matter which one of those we answer yes to. Answering yes to any one of them is enough to make it a capital E. The key, however, is that you do want to go through all four questions. Because if it turns out that it's a capital lease, then you'll need to determine the present value of the lease payments no matter what. So we have a capital lease. The question is, how do we go about accounting for capital leases? And this is where, again, things get a little bit more complicated as compared to an operating lease operating lease. So what we mean by a capital lease is essentially again this substance over form thing. So the substance of the transaction is such that we are essentially purchasing the asset or it's going to be accounted for as if we were purchasing the asset even though we are technically not purchasing it. The substance of the transaction is that we are making a substantial use of the life of the asset we're paying for a vast majority of the fair market value. We're ending up paying for about 94% of the fair market value. And so the substance of the transaction is essentially that we're purchasing this with long-term financing. We're just calling it a lease instead of a purchase, but effectively, or from a financial accounting standpoint, it's going to be accounted for as if we were purchasing the asset. So keep that in mind as we go through the journal entries, the recognition of all of the transactions that are necessary. So the first thing is that on January 1st, we are going to recognize the fact that we have leased assets. And so we're going to debit an asset account, typically called leased assets, and credit leased liability for the smaller of the present value of the lease payments or the fair market value lease payments or the present value of the lease payments here are $84,224. Fair market value is $90,000. And so we know uh, that we're going to record this at $84,224. Then we have June 30th and December 31st to deal with the lease payments themselves. So we need to figure out uh, how to account for the lease payments. And the accounting for the lease payments is going to be virtually the same as if we had an installment note payable from a previous chapter. You remember, hopefully, how to account for a installment note payable where the payment that we make, each payment is a combination of interest and principal. So when we make a $10,000 payment here on June 30th, part of that's going to go to interest, part of that's going to go to principal. The question is, how much? Well, go back to our basic formula for determining interest expense. Interest expense is computed as the book value of a liability multiplied by the assigned or appropriate interest rate multiplied by the portion of year for which this interest payment applies. So the lease liability has a book value of $84,224. So $84,224. The discount rate or the interest rate that applies to this is 6.5%, 0.065. And uh, from January 1st to June 30th is six months. Uh, and so we multiply this by 6 divided by 12, and that will tell us what our interest expense is. So the liability has been outstanding for six months, and the interest payment is or the interest expense, I should say, is $2,737 to begin with. Okay, and so our first cash payment is $10,000. Of that, $2,737 goes to interest expense. The rest of it then goes to satisfying the lease liability, which is just simply the difference between the $10,000 payment and the $2,737 of interest expense. And that's our first lease payment. The second lease payment is going to be computed essentially the same way. Uh, there is going to be one little difference though. Notice that the lease liability started out at an $84,224 balance. We have now reduced that lease liability by $7,263. So the balance of the lease liability uh, decreases uh, every time we make a payment. And so that means that our interest expense calculation is going to change. The process is the same, but how we go about determining interest expense is going to be a little bit different, or 
is going to be the same, but the dollar amount is going to be different. Okay, so we started out with $84,224. We have reduced the liability by $7,263. And so at this point, as of June 30th, the balance is $76,961. Again, we multiply that by 6.5% and multiply it by 6 divided by 12 because from June 30th to December 31st is another six months worth of interest. And that works out to $2,501 of interest expense for this period. So when we go to record the transaction, we credit cash for $10,000. Interest expense uh, gets uh, debited for $2,501 and uh, the lease liability gets amortized or reduced again by another $7,499. So that's what happens with respect to uh, the lease payments themselves. So, so far, we've recognized an asset and a lease liability. We've recognized two cash payments, applying the appropriate amount of the cash payment to interest expense as well as lease liability. The last thing that we need to remember to do with a capital lease is to remember that we've got leased assets here of uh, a debit balance of $84,224. Leased assets are going to be treated the same as if we had purchased them. In other words, they need to be depreciated. And so we have to compute the depreciation on this particular uh, lease. And so we've got $84,000. $224, and this is a five-year lease. Uh, remember, we're leasing this now for five out of the six-year use of life. So the lease term is what determines our depreciation, not the useful life. It's the useful life of the asset to us as the lessee. Well, we're leasing it for five years, so we're going to allocate that leased asset over a five-year time period. That gives us $16,845 of depreciation expense for this year. And so we will recognize depreciation expense and credit accumulated depreciation on leased assets of $16,845. So that's pretty straightforward, the depreciation part. Just remember that the depreciation is based on the lease term, not the useful life. It's how long we are going to be using the asset, uh, not the total useful life of the asset. All right. So that's all of the journal entries. Once again, we will take these journal entries and determine uh, the balance sheet as well as potentially the income statement impact. Notice here that we now have a reduced liability. Started out at eighty-four thousand some odd dollars. We reduced it by seventy-two sixty-three. Reduced it again by seventy-four ninety-nine. Uh, we have some expenses that are going to show up on the income statement, interest expense uh, of uh, just over $5,000, depreciation expense of just under $17,000. And so there's a lot of balance sheet and income statement impact that's going to happen here. All right, so let's take uh, the asset side of the balance sheet first. Uh, on the asset side of the balance sheet, uh, we simply take the uh, leased asset for its original historical cost and subtract the accumulated depreciation. That'll tell us what our net book value of the asset is. On the liability side, we'll take the original liability, subtract the two debits to the lease liability account, and that'll be our total lease liability that's on the balance sheet. There is one little caveat here, and that is Next year, we're going to make two payments. So part of that lease liability is going to be paid off in the second year, and the rest of it is going to be paid off in years three, four, and five. Technically, that means that we have some portion of this lease, lease liability is a current liability, and some portion is a long-term liability. In order to split that up between current and long-term portion, what you would need to do is at least do the calculations for the next two lease payments. You don't have to do the journal entries because we're not there yet. We're not in the second year. We're just at 
December 31st of year one. So you don't have to do the journal entries, but you'd have to do the calculations. You'd have to figure out how much interest expense is going to be charged June 30th year two, how much interest expense is going to be charged uh, December 31st year two, and uh, from that you could derive how much lease liability is going to be remaining on the balance sheet. So here's what ends up happening on the balance sheet. Uh, we have leased assets with a net balance of 67000 some odd dollars. Once again, uh, that's just simply the original cost minus the accumulated depreciation. The lease liability, the total lease liability, we can figure that out. The total lease liability started out at 84,224, and then we subtracted 7263, and we subtracted another 7499. And so the total lease liability on the balance sheet is 69,462. Um, and we can separate that into current and long-term portions. The current, whoops, the current liability, the current portion and the long-term portion add up to that 69,462. So we can see that we've got a total balance of 69,462. And I went ahead and determined that 15,000 of that uh, would be amortized in the second year. And I did that by initially taking 69,462, multiplying that by 6.5% times 6 twelfths. That would be my first amortization. And then I would recalculate the balance as of June 30th, 2014. Uh, recalculate the amortization and the combination of those two amortization payments uh, means that I'm going to reduce my lease liability by $15,736. The difference between what gets charged off or amortized in 2014 uh, and the total amount of lease liability is the long-term portion. Uh, and so that's how we account for a capital lease. So the basic process is first, determine whether we have an operating or capital lease. Do we answer yes to any one of the four questions? If we do, then you can see that things get significantly more complicated from an accounting standpoint. We have to uh, capitalize the asset at the lesser of the present value of the lease payments or the fair market value. And then we also have to uh, amortize the lease payments uh, between reductions of lease liability and interest expense, and we also have to be sure to depreciate the asset. And then make sure that we get our balance sheet disclosure in particular correct. Uh, I have not done the income statement uh, disclosures here, but just remember that from an income statement standpoint, it's the expenses that have gotten charged uh, that would be of interest to us. Uh, so $2,737 of interest expense there, $2,501 of interest expense there, and $16,845 of depreciation expense all get recognized on the balance sheet. And so that's how we account for a capital lease.